Good morning, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. This was a surprise because when I started my podcast, it didn't work. Lord have mercy. Great to be back with you again for our weekly chat. Hoping that you're doing well, that you're staying safe, and you're taking the time to be family together. As usual, let's begin with a prayer to the Holy Spirit, O Heavenly King. O Heavenly King, the comfort of the Spirit of truth, who are everywhere and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, O good one. This morning, we're going to try to do uh, a dual focus, if you will, for our our podcast. Uh, Let me just move this over for a second. First, we're going to finish our our look at the Ten Commandments. Specifically looking at the last commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his ass or anything that is your neighbor's. And how that Tenth Commandment impacts our lives. And then we're going to look at the nativity fast and our responsibilities in it. So stay tuned. As always in our podcast, if you do have any questions or comments, please enter them in the section below and I'll try to get them to them as soon as I can. So let's start with the Ten Commandments, the last one in our, in our look at the Ten Commandments. And here, the church tradition of the, of the Ten Commandments commands that we accept whatever God places in our lives. And we're not called to be envious of one another or to look upon others with hate on their well-being and the prosperity of the other person. There is great gain in godliness with contentment. For all of us brought nothing into the world and all of us can take nothing out of the world. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, fall into a snare, into many senseless and hurtful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. In Hebrews, we find this quote, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never fail you nor forsake you. And that's a really important point because I think too many times all of us get caught up in that, in that not just the desire to have, have money and, and possessions, but to kind of live life in a, in a constant state of contentment where everything is kind of like at ease and, and, uh, and that's not the way life is we realize that many of us go through afflictions and and turmoil and trials and tribulation. And many of us are tempted in those times to look at other people who don't have those trials, who do not have those temptations, who do not have those tribulations. And there's a sense of envy, a sense of jealousy. You know, why me, Lord? But the church tradition teaches us we need to be learn how to be content with our state and to place our trust in God alone. In 1 Corinthians, we find this wonderful passage that everyone lead the life which the Lord has assigned to him and in which God has called him. Everyone should remain in the state in which he was called. So brethren, in whatever state you have been called, there remain with God. I guess if we're truly being logical in a a spiritual sense, that means that whatever that state 
we are in in terms of life, whether it's a trial or tribulation um, or something that's happened that is good that we celebrate or something that, that ha has happened that is not good, that is leaving us struggling. We still have to trust that God is with us in this. God will bring us through both the trials and tribulations, but also carry us through just regular routine daily things in life. Um, <clears throat> too many times, especially with, with this emphasis on this 10th commandment, we, we make the mistake of wondering <clears throat> what it would be like <clears throat> to have a different circumstance, to live in a different situation. Um, if we had better possessions, if we had more money, if our, if our health was better, whatever. And I think if we're not careful, that leads us to trust less in God and more in somehow our own power to do things and to, and to change things. And as this sinful person can, can share with you, that kind of thought is way above my pay grade. Who, who am I to think that I can control my life better than God? And the answer is, I'm nobody. And I think we all need to sort of like be mindful of that. Um, so along with that 10th commandment, th there are related um, issues of self-reflection that we can look at that apply here. For example, have I, envied, ha have I envied anyone or anything good that has come to others? Have I been jealous about a good thing that has happened to someone else? Have I wished for anything that belonged to someone else? Have I damaged or destroyed anything that belongs to someone else? Have I wished for things God has not given me or been dissatisfied with what he has provided me? Have I shared when I had the opportunity? And that's an important one. Too many times we, we are blessed by God to have a, a, an abundance or a surplus of, of things, possessions, money, whatever. And like the, the parable of the, the rich fool who tore down old barns and build up, built up new ones, we've got to be mindful that when we have a surplus, when God has blessed us, when God has given us things, we're called to share from our bounty. Have I hoped for anyone to fail so I could get what they have? In the business world, you know, um, how many times I've heard the phrase cutthroat, you know, looking out for yourself and, and don't worry about the other person. Um, it's a sad commentary on, on where, where sometimes life leads us. Have I failed to be kind and giving to others? especially now in the time of Christmas. Too many times we're, we're tempted by, by the demons to look at someone who's in need, who maybe come, comes to our door, comes to our church, comes to, to see us in the sidewalk in the public places and, and asks for help and asks for food or asks for clothing or asks for money. And we right away, not all of us, some of us, are, are moved to judge that person you look healthy. You know, oh yeah, mentally we're judging them. You look healthy. Why aren't you working? You know, um, that's not that's not ours to do. Um, that could be Christ in disguise. Most definitely. Have I expected God to give me things when I refuse to give to others? Um, The bottom line for this 10th commandment, I think, is that society in general encourages us to want what everybody else has. Keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. Encourages us to follow our dreams by telling us to look to others and to their possessions to determine what those dreams should be. And we're all tempted to do that. 
In the Orthodox Christian tradition, God has another plan for us. God gives us what we need to make us who he knows we should be. Think about that. He gives us what we need because he knows what we should be. In our effort to find ourselves, we discover that the only place we'll find complete fulfillment is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in trusting in God. This commandment is all about, it's not being all about me. Okay? Hopefully that will kind of help us as we move forward during this holy season of Christmas. Speaking of which, I'd like to sort of share a, a second perspective now, and that is on the, the Christmas season itself, the Nativity Fast. And I think that's important, um, especially given the, 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 the two calendars, because tomorrow is, is the Nativity Feast for those on the Gregorian calendar, while those of us on the Julian calendar will celebrate on January 7th. But I think it's important to sort of get a, get a sense of why the church gives us this, this nativity season, this fast season. The feast of the nativity of Christ belongs to the number of the 12 major feasts of, of, of our Lord through the church. Yet none of these feasts is celebrated by the church with as much solemnity as the feast of our Lord's birth. It is actually called Pascha, a splendid three-day Pascha. In the old editions of the Typicon, similarly to the Feast of Christ's Resurrection, the Feast of our Lord's Birth is called Pascha. This emphasizes its close connection with the mystery of our salvation and our deliverance from sin and death. The mystery which the Holy Church proclaims in her teachings and with which she brings us into direct spiritual contact through her services and sacraments. Liturgical services for Christmas, officially called the Nativity according to the flesh of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, are consciously patterned after the services for our Lord's resurrection. There is a 40-day fast. There are pre-feast preparations. There are special royal hours with their prophecies their epistles, their gospels, and their hymns on the eve of the feast, followed by the Vesperal Liturgy of St. Basil the Great. There is the solemn all-night festival vigil, crowned by the Matins Canon and the hymns. And finally, of course, the festal Eucharistic celebration of the Liturgy of John Chrysostom. The celebration continue, continues to its completion in the festival of the meeting of our Lord in the Temple, 40 days later. At the center of the festival season remains the original festival light of lights, the holy epiphany of our Lord. And it's interesting that as we go through the, the nativity season, um, the church constantly is, is telling us not only to remember our Lord's birth, but also to, to focus on what is happening to us as we move through this, 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 this holy season. So, if we think about the nativity, and thinking about the, the, icon, the icon of the nativity, we know that the God-infant Jesus lays an infant in the ca cavern in the reign of Caesar Augustus, so that later, during the reign of Pontius Pilate, he would lay in the tomb. He was hounded by Herod that he might be caught by Caiaphas. He was buried in baptism that he might descend into death through the cross. He was worshipped by wise men that all of creation might adore him in his triumph over death. The Pascha of his cross was prepared by the Pascha of his coming. The Pascha of his resurrection was begun by the Pascha of his incarnation. The Pascha of his glorification was foretold by the Pascha of his baptism. This is what Chris, Christians celebrate each year, and what the late Dean of St. Vladimir's Seminary, Father Alexander Schremen, was the first to call the Winter Pascha. So, thinking about that, during the, the Nativity Fast season, 
We know, those of us who are in the church, we know that the Nativity Fast is not as, as strict in terms of its, its, its liturgical services as the, the uh, Great Lenten Fast. There are, though, times when we are called during the Nativity Fast to prepare ourselves for Holy Confession, to prepare ourselves to receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, but also, more importantly, to practice that wonderful Orthodox, excuse me, Christian tradition of almsgiving, looking out for the poor and the needy in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our parishes, um, especially during the, the time of, of the Christmas season. Uh, that's when people are, are most in need, not just for possessions, not just for, for things of the world, but also are most in need of love and compassion and understanding of human contact. And now during this time of the COVID season, this COVID pandemic, um, we're even more obligated to, to look out for one another, to, to try to practice almsgiving, even if we can't do it in person, you know, make sure that we, we're, we're giving to people in need. Um, and I think that's really important that we do that. Um, so, uh, as, as those who are on the Gregorian calendar come to their, their Christmas Eve services today and also for the Nativity seat, uh, lit Liturgy tomorrow for them, we wish them a blessed uh, Christ is born. Glorify him. For those of us who are on the, the old calendar, uh, stay focused. Stay in, in that sense of, of preparing ourselves. Stay in that, in that willingness to, to practice almsgiving. But most importantly, stay in that prayerful mode of of, in combination with the Tenth Commandment, of not looking uh, to better ourselves, but looking how to, to go beyond ourselves and to look to help one another. Okay, that's it for today. I hope um, our, our discussion this morning has caused or enabled you to, to reflect, has given you a willingness to, to look beyond uh, yourself, and to practice almsgiving, but also importantly, to, to, to be content with where God has, has brought you uh, in, in life. Um, a special shout out to my dear granddaughter Katie um, and my dear daughter Malava, who are stuck in the hospital after Katie's surgery for removal of her appendix. Um, we love you. We know God is, is taking care of you. Um, and we ask everyone's prayers on, on, on their behalf. So let's com conclude with our prayer to the Mother of God, as we do uh, at every podcast. Steadfast protectress of Christians, constant advocate before the Creator, do not despise the cry of us sinners. In your goodness, come speedily to help us who call upon you in faith. Hasten to our petition and to intercede for us of the Autolkos, for you always protect those who honor you. And um, my dear viewers, we love you. We thank you for taking the time to be with us. Know that we lift you all up in prayer. We ask that you pray for us as well, because in lifting each other up in prayer, we are truly united in Christ. God bless.